Hello, and welcome to our live and ticking event on cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or better known as CPR. Um, I'm Jenny Hargrave. I'm the Director of, of, of Health Programmes at the British Heart Foundation. And today I'm stepping in as host for this special Heart Month edition of Live and Ticking, instead of our usual host, Fergal McKinney. As February is Heart Month, we want to encourage as many people as possible to learn CPR. Many of us will, but will witness a cardiac arrest in our lifetime, and we want everyone to be ready for that day. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers for this event, including our own senior cardiac nurse, Ruth Goss. Ruth will be going through the basics of, of CPR and how we can all learn it at home with our Reviver app. We will also hear from a BHF funded researcher, Doc, Dr. Barbara Farkerson. She will discuss her work on whether adding behavior change techniques um, to, to, emerge, to what emergency call handlers say over the phone could increase people's confidence in performing CPR. So before we move on to our speakers, we'd like to gauge your current understanding of CPR and of cardiac arrest. So the poll question should be visible to you now. And if you could just complete this, um, how would you rate your understanding of CPR and cardiac arrest? Rating one to five with one being very low and five being very high. Just take a minute to, uh, to collect your, your thoughts. Okay, it's an interesting mix there. We'll also be looking at this at the end to hopefully see whether today's session has actually helped to improve some of that. So we would also like to, or I'd also like to remind everyone that, that you can ask questions at any time during this talk and compose by, by posting your questions in the Q&A in the Zoom chat. And we'll aim to answer as many of those as possible after the talks. You can also use the thumbs up button to upvote on any of those questions, especially if they're similar to what you've asked. So now we're going to start the event proper. And I'd like to welcome our best, our, our, our guest, I'll start again, apologies, our first guest speaker, um, who's our senior cardiac nurse, Ruth Goss. Over to you, Ruth. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. If you can bear with me just one second, I'm just going to bring my slides up um, for my presentation this afternoon. So hello again, um, my name's Ruth. I'm one of the senior cardiac nurses with the BHF um, and I've, with, I've been with them for about two years now um, work, after working in critical care in the NHS. And today I'm going to talk to you about what is CPR What's a cardiac arrest? Why does it happen? Quick run through of how to give CPR, answer some frequently asked questions, and then talk about what happens next and what you can do going forward um, if you come across someone who's in cardiac arrest. So to start with, I thought I'd start with one of my CPR stories. Working in a cardiac surgery unit, cardiac arrests happened. They happened a, a lot more frequently than they would maybe be elsewhere. So I've given CPR to many different types of people in many different types of scenarios. You're in a hospital, you're a part of a team, you may have people around you who have more experience in CPR, but I was still nervous. Was I going to do it right? Would the patient be okay? That first time before doing it, I was still nervous. So I, I can completely resonate with people who might be afraid of doing it in the beginning. I remember my first time, um, post-surgery, no warning, and as strange as it sounded, when the patient went into cardiac arrest, my mind went into focus mode. You kind of got your game face on, and you started doing CPR, you started delivering that life-saving treatment, um, gave chest compressions, and then helped where I was needed when the larger sort of resus team arrived. I didn't think, am I hurting them, or am I breaking anyone's ribs? Lots of people think that. What I was thinking at the time was, have I done enough? Am I doing this right? Thankfully, in that instance, it was a good outcome. They survived, but I have had other experiences when it wasn't like a favorable outcome. Ultimately, CPR is so important for anyone that goes into cardiac arrest, whether that's out in the community or in a hospital setting. And I hope my talk this afternoon is going to inspire you to learn CPR and become one of our potential lifesavers. 
So what is CPR? So CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It is life-saving, potentially life-saving for someone who is in cardiac arrest. If someone goes into cardiac arrest, their heart isn't beating properly or not beating at all. And that means that blood isn't flowing around the body and that can lead to damage to the other organs if the blood isn't flowing there. When you give CPR, the chest compressions are acting as an artificial pump in a way. Your compressions are pumping blood around the body while the heart can't. In some cases, a defibrillator or a defib, something that you've maybe heard or, or seen or used yourselves, that can be used um, to treat a cardiac arrest. It can shock someone out of a life-threatening rhythm to help the, heat, the heart beat normally again. CPR is the first step of treatment for anyone in cardiac arrest, and every minute without CPR and defibrillation can reduce the chances of survival by up to 10%. But what is good to know is that CPR can more than double the chances of survival in some cases if you get those hand, like, hands on the chest and start delivering those compressions as soon as you can. So what can cause a cardiac arrest? These aren't all the causes. I would not have time to go through all the causes of what can cause a cardiac arrest, but these are the more common ones. The main one is sort of life-threatening arrhythmias. There are many arrhythmias. You may have heard of things like AF, but not, and, and not all of them are life-threatening. The term life-threatening includes arrhythmias that prevent the heart from pumping blood around the body effectively. Ventricular fibrillation is one of these, where the main pumping chambers of the heart quiver or shake rather than beating effectively due to an issue with the electrics of the heart. There are some other heart conditions which can increase your risk of cardiac arrest, particularly if they affect the, the electrics of your heart, and this can include some inherited conditions. Severe valve disease as well, if left untreated, can put pressure on your heart, which can increase your risk. Heart attacks, I'll go into this in a bit more detail shortly. And then there's other major medical traumas like bleeding, electrocution, drug overdoses. They can all impact how your body works normally, put pressure onto your heart and then lead to a cardiac arrest. So to go back to heart attacks, heart attack or cardiac arrest, one can cause the other, but they're not the same thing. In cardiac arrest, it's an electrical problem. The electrics of the heart aren't working well causing the heart to stop beating effectively or stopping completely. That person will be unconscious and that person will need CPR. Without CPR, the person will not survive. A defibrillator can be used in some cases by shocking the heart back into a normal rhythm, but not necessarily for every arrest. If it's a heart attack, that's a circulation problem, sometimes called a plumbing problem. The blood flow to the heart itself is blocked, and this can cause irreversible damage to the heart if the person doesn't get to hospital. It's likely they will be conscious. This is also a medical emergency, and you should call 999 for medical help. In some cases, a heart attack can cause a cardiac arrest, but it depends on a lot of factors, such as what part of the heart is damaged by a heart attack. So how to give CPR? This is the most important part that I can kind of go through today for you. So first steps, before you approach anyone, make sure it's safe. Do not approach anyone unless you think it's safe. If you don't want to put yourself at risk of, of an injury or, or, or anything like that. So if you come across someone in cardiac arrest and it's safe, they will be unconscious and they may not be breathing or not breathing normally. It can sound like grunting or gasping. So what you do is you shake and you shout them saying, can you hear me? And if there's no response, call for help. If there is someone with you, you then get them to call 999. If not, call 999 yourself before starting CPR. This ensures that the ambulance control can get you the help you need. They can get a paramedic and an ambulance out to you to help save this person's life. If once you've called 999 if someone else is with you ask them to go and find the nearest defibrillator however if you're on your own don't leave the patient and just go on to the next step and start giving chest compressions so to, to deliver chest compressions you want to kneel beside the patient put one hand in the center of their chest and place the other on top and lock your fingers as you can see in the image on my screen you want to keep your arms as straight as you can and push down firmly on the chest 
You want to aim for 100 to 120 beats per minute, but don't worry about that number. You may have seen in other adverts or, or other stories that the beat of the song Staying Alive is a good example of the pace that you want to aim for. You want to push down firmly and smoothly, and you want to push down for about five to six centimetres deep. Don't get too hung up on these numbers. Just try the best that you can, keep those arms straight and try and keep a nice regular rhythm going. The call handler um, from the ambulance service will be helping you through this as well. The next step is to keep going. And sometimes this is the hardest part. You've got to keep going until professional helps arrives. If someone else comes to help or you've got a few more people with you, you can tell them how to give compressions. If you're feeling tired, swap around, rotate it's what we do in hospitals. If you're on your own, it makes it a little bit harder, but it's other people there, rotate, don't exhaust yourself. Keep going because you have to try and keep going until the ambulance arrives. You're giving the best person, you're giving the best the person the best chance of survival if you can continue to keep going. If a defibrillator arrives, turn it on and follow the instructions. The defib is going to look at the patient and decide whether they need to be shocked or not. Straightforward, you turn it on, put the pads on, and the defib will tell you to press shock if they say it's needed. Otherwise, it'll say no shock advised and you will continue with CPR until an ambulance arrives. A lot of people have some questions or some thoughts when, when we talk about giving CPR and I've answered a couple of them here. So firstly, do I need to give mouth to mouth? So rescue breaths is a more technical term for it. Um, the UK guidelines say if you're trained or you're comfortable to do so, then yes, you can give two rescue breaths or mouth to mouth to the patient. Some people might feel comfortable to do this if it's a family member. We know that 80% of cardiac arrests can happen in the home, um, but you may be less comfortable doing this to a stranger if you come across somebody in the street. So if you want to do this, you want to count for 30 compressions or get someone to count for you, then tilt the patient's chin and gently move their head back, pinch their nose, cover their mouth with yours and blow hard for one second. You want to do this twice. And then you continue to do so 30 compressions for two breaths. If you don't want to do this, continue to give chest compressions. Hands only CPR is still giving the patient a good chance of survival. What if I break their ribs? This is another one that we hear, hear quite often. It's unfortunate, but it does happen. Broken ribs can happen with CPR, but it's important to remember that ribs can heal. A person will not survive if they are in cardiac arrest and don't receive any CPR. From my own experiences and speaking to people who have had CPR when I was working in hospitals, they've always been thankful that they've had CPR despite any chest pain, rib pain, broken ribs. So that's really important to know. And then the next thing is what happens next. Once the ambulance arrives, the paramedics will take over CPR. The patient will be taken to hospital for further treatment once the paramedics decide if it's safe to move them. If it's someone you know, if it's a family member, it's likely you're going to find out what happens to them. However, if it's someone you don't know, this can leave you wondering what happened to them? Did I do the right thing? And you may have lots of other questions. You may never find out what happened to that patient or that person that you gave CPR to, but there is a lot of support out there if you have questions after delivering CPR. The most important thing to remember is if you give CPR, you are giving them the best chance of survival. You want to talk to your friends and family about your experiences. You might not want to do this right away. It might take you a few days. The adrenaline will be pumping. You might just want to keep it to yourself. But talk to your friends and family once you've done it. Just kind of unloading that information and discussing it can sometimes help. But if you are really struggling and having lots of questions, talk to your GP. They can they can signpost you to counselling and, and, and other sort of um, help if you need it. You can also contact the British Heart Foundation Heart Helpline. And um, you can go onto our website and um, get in touch with us sort of via email or live chat. We will be happy to talk to you about your experiences and, and, and give you some further support. In some cases, you could also contact your local ambulance service. They may be happy to facilitate a debrief for you, talk about what happened, talk about what they did, why they did, and, and speak to you as well. And then you could also reach out to support groups for those who have given CPR. There are a few 
out there, certainly on social media and things like that. Um, but reach out. You aren't on your own in this. Um, and when you're ready to talk about it, if you want to talk about it, people are there to listen. So if you are now inspired to learn CPR, and I hope you are, <laughs> and you can learn it in 15 minutes with the BHF Reviver app. It's going to teach you how to recognize cardiac arrest. It will simulate a 999 call so that when you call 999 or if you have to call 999 in a cardiac arrest, you can almost expect what, what you might be asked. It will talk you through how to give CPR. It will also check how well you're doing your compressions. If you're going at the right rate, you get that live feedback. And it also goes through how to use a defibrillator from putting the pads on and, and, and when to press the button in those prompts. All you need is a mobile phone and quite a firm pillow. You could even use a rucksack and you can scan the QR code on my screen if you want to sort of have it on the back burner if you're wanting to look at it after this session. So I hope that's been interesting for you and that you're all inspired to use our app and not feel too afraid of delivering CPR. And I'll be happy to take questions from you at the end of the session. Yeah, that was really inspiring, Ruth. Thank you so much. Um, and as, as Ruth quite rightly said, 80% of all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests happen in people's own homes. So they're most likely to happen to somebody you know. Um, and that's why it's so important to be ready for that day. Um, hopefully it will never happen to you, but so much, so important to be prepared. And I, I, I do have uh, personal experience of that, but I, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details right now, but, um, but I do know that, that it really, really does make a difference. Um, so, Thank you, Ruth. Really appreciate your, your really inspiring presentation. I'm now going to introduce you to Dr. Barbara Farkerson, um, who is a BHF funded researcher, and she's going to talk to you about the research she's been doing around, around this area of work. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm hoping you can see my slides okay, Jenny? Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for inviting me here today to talk about um, my research. Um, oops, it's not moving. Sorry, technical issue. Um, I'm a cardiac nurse by background too, and the best years of my nursing career were spent on a coronary care unit and as a British Heart Foundation community cardiac rehab nurse. Um, I loved being able to provide that intensive nursing care in the coronary care unit and I really enjoyed supporting people once they went home and in those first few weeks of trying to get back to normal. But I've also worked in other areas, in medical wards, in health promotion and at the telephone helpline NHS 24, which is a bit like NHS Direct. And I think my experience in all these areas means that I've seen heart problems and how they affect people before hospital, in hospital and after hospital. And I think seeing problems from all those different perspectives has been really helpful. I've also been always been particularly interested in the psychological aspects of care um, understanding that what people think and feel about their heart problem affects what they do about it. Um, and so when I made the move into research, it was a psychological um, aspect of care I was interested in. Um, my PhD explored whether how people think and feel about their symptoms predicts how long it will take them to um, call for medical help. And to do this, I worked closely with health psychologists and learned about behavioural science, um, which is a scientific discipline that tries to understand what predicts behaviour and what techniques we can use to change behaviour. There are lots of different theories and they argue a lot about them and they've all got complicated names, but generally the, there's a really strong body of evidence that shows that our attitudes about a behaviour, what we think others think about a behaviour and our confidence in doing that behaviour um, will lead to our intentions, whether or not we would intend to do that behaviour, which in turn leads to behaviour. So if you think of some behaviours that this has been commonly applied to, like, for example, increasing exercise, if you have an attitude that exercise is a good thing, that it's good for you, that you think others will approve, and you're confident that you could go out and take yourself for a brisk walk or go for a run, um, then you will have strong intentions to do that behaviour. 
Now, whether those intentions get you off the sofa and out for a brisk walk, and that's a different story. Um, but without those intentions, it's unlikely that you're going to do it, find yourself in the gym by accident. So these things are important and behavioral science is trying to create the attitudes and the ideas about what other people think and give you the confidence to do particular behaviors. And um, we also have what I called um, techniques to change behavior or behavior change techniques. Um, and there's 93 of these have so far been identified, believe it or not, there's even more. Um, and these are techniques that we can use to encourage people to behave differently. So giving instruction or telling someone what to do is one of those, but there are 92 others. So for example, verbal persuasion about capability, persuading someone that they can do it, um, or encouraging someone to identify themselves as a role model for others. And um, these are things that might help someone to, um, to change their behavior. Essentially, this is a menu of things that we can try if information alone isn't enough. And I use the science to tackle important issues for people with heart problems. So as I said, my focus is on the things that happen before hospital. Um, most deaths from heart disease happen before the person gets into hospital. And so this is where we can make the biggest difference. And I'm working on two main things, reducing delay with heart symptoms, um, the heart attack that Ruth talked about and increasing rates of CPR. So it's this work around CPR that the British Heart Foundation are supporting at the moment. And you've heard from Ruth about how critical CPR is um, when someone's heart stops suddenly and they collapse. They will not survive without it. CPR maintains the flow of oxygen to the vital organs until the cause of the collapse can be treated, for example, by a defibrillator. Only one in 10 people who have a cardiac arrest outside of hospital survive in the UK at the moment. And those chances of survival diminish with every minute that passes without CPR. A big problem we have is that CPR is often not performed, even by those who've been trained. Um, studies have shown that about half of those who've been trained perform CPR when it actually happens. And there are a number of reasons why someone who's trained might not intervene. So as Ruth mentioned, it's often the someone you love that you'll witness having a cardiac arrest and the overwhelming emotion of the situation can get in the way. People are worried about doing harm or getting it wrong and maybe just a bit confidence in their ability if they've not done it for a while. So one of the most important things to do is to call 999 and the 999 call handlers will provide step-by-step -step instructions so you don't need to remember everything. They follow a strict protocol very closely and this is very effective at getting CPR started quickly. However, even when these instructions are provided, sometimes delays to CPR happen. These delays cost lives. We want to reduce that delay and get CPR started faster. So my research is looking at whether including behavioral theory in the protocols that these call handlers use could help people start CPR faster. So I've analysed 200 recorded 999 calls where CPR was involved, and I've identified the most common barriers to CPR. There are some, for example, someone falling in an awkward situation where people can't reach them that the call handlers can't really do anything about. But there are some, for example, someone thinking it's too late, they're already dead, um, worried about hurting the person. These are things that we think behavior change techniques might help the call handlers to deal with. I've also interviewed 30 UK call handlers to find out what they think helps and hinders. They give these instructions every day at work and they really know a lot. Um, so they identified many of the same issues that we identified in the call recordings. Um, and they also told us about some of the things that they try to try and overcome those barriers. Um, they also told us that they would really appreciate some extra guidance of helpful things to say. So they were really enthusiastic about the work that we were doing. These interviews have also made sure that we understand what it's like to be someone giving those instructions and to have that role. And so that any changes that we suggest um, will be realistic ones that we can implement. And what we plan to do next is to um, incorporate those techniques, the things that we've learned from the call handlers, um, and, and to work with experts to select techniques that might be useful in this context 
Obviously, the techniques we use need to be able to be delivered in a super brief way um, to be useful in this context. And so we're going to work with the experts to identify some things that might help. We'll then incorporate those techniques into the call handlers protocols and test in simulated calls and um, whether or not they make a difference. And that's all a bit abstract. I thought it might be helpful to give you some examples. Um, so I've got two examples and the, the words in green are real words from a recorded call that I analyze. Um, and in this first example, you can see that the caller has been asked to get the patient onto the floor to start CPR. And they're saying she's just been in hospital and had a wound and she's got a wound on her tummy. They're worried about hurting her because of this wound and the movement of getting her onto the floor. So in blue on the right is what the current protocol would tell the call handler to say, don't worry about the fall, we need to help her now. Whatever they say, that's what they say. Don't worry about the fall, we need to help them now. So our alternative, and this is not, this is an idea of what our alternative might be. We're still working on the exact wording and, and what we're going to do. Um, but this is an example of where we think a behavior change technique might help. So to say that nothing can hurt her more right now than not receiving CPR. So anything you're worried about, nothing is more important than CPR. So we feel that's a bit more specific than just don't worry. They are absolutely worried and telling them not to worry isn't going to stop them worrying. Um, but reframing that, that's the technique into there's nothing worse you could do than not give them CPR um, might be something that's helpful. And in the second example, the, the caller was actually screaming, I can't do it, I can't do it. This is a Scottish call, obviously. Um, they, they're worried that they can't do it. Um, and the, currently the protocol would just be that the call handler would continue with their instructions, place the heel of your hand on the breastbone and start compressing. Um, but what we would be suggesting that behavior change techniques where, for example, you use social comparison. So comparing to a child and saying that a child as young as eight has been able to do this, you can do it, verbal persuasion of capability. And also saying, I'm gonna help you just do exactly what I say responds to the obvious fear and upset and and gives that impression that you know this the call handler is on their side which they absolutely are and um, so that's what we hope that adding techniques like that will help more people to initiate cpr more quickly and if more people do um, more lives will be saved and that's the impact that we want to see and um, the most commonly used protocol by ambulance services is used in 46 countries. And um, so if we do find evidence that this is helpful, it could be implemented around the world um, very quickly. And this research would not be happening without British Heart Foundation support. And um, there are very few opportunities um, for nurses to lead research beyond a PhD, particularly in Scotland, where I'm based. Um, so the British Heart Foundation, with these fellowships that have funded me, are playing a really important role in helping nurses and other clinicians to develop this capability and to do research that reflects their perspective on things and, and hopefully the patients too. Um, and the fellowship has also provided me the opportunity to attract additional funding from other funders. Um, and I've got a number of different applications in process as well. So I hope you'll agree it's a good investment and important work. And I'm really grateful for the British Heart Foundation's support and for the support of the call handlers, the Scottish Ambulance Service, and my collaborators, Gareth Clegg and Mary Johnson, who helped with this work. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Thanks so much, Barbara. I think that's been absolutely fascinating. And I think just seeing the the, the, the nuanced difference of behaviour change language uh, in terms of building confidence and improving outcomes and making people feel more reassured at a very difficult time. And it is difficult, but it but it's it's such an important thing to do. Um, what 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 a change um and i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing the outcomes of your research i think that will be fed into um further information training and support that that comes out of the british heart foundation as well i'm quite certain of that great well thank you barbara and appreciate that um so we're now going to move on to um a series of videos that uh, that were 
uh, filmed for our Heart Hero Awards and hear from some of our, our absolutely brilliant Heart Heroes who, have, as, as it says on the slide, who've all showed incredible courage and bravery performing CPR. So I'm going to hand over to the team to, to display those. Tuesday the 3rd of August um, started off as a very, very normal day for us. Um, Sienna was bright, happy, playful. Um, we'd met my friend Kaylee and her children and we went for a walk, we went to the park. Um, and as I say, Sienna was happy, eating ice cream, playing. And suddenly she became become very, very ill, very, very quickly with no warning. Um, and I decided it was probably best to get her home. So I popped her in the car seat and loaded the car up, ready to get going. Um, my friend Kaylee called out to me that Sienna didn't look right, something wasn't right. Um, Sienna was very unwell in her car seat. Her eyes were rolling, she'd become pale, she grunting, struggling to breathe. Her body felt like really firm, but at the same time, like I was losing her. Um, I got her out of the car seat, I cuddled her, and her breathing started to become less and less and I could see she was visibly struggling. Before the ambulance arrived, I was holding Sienna um, and she fell unconscious in my arms. I, understandably, was distraught and my friend Kaylee took over. She laid Sienna in the hallway of her house and as directed by the call responder, she started to perform CPR to save Sienna's life. Upon our consultation with the Royal Brompton Hospital, we later learned that Sienna had several other heart conditions, with the worst one being the incurable and inherited heart condition, Brigada syndrome. For Sienna to be recognised as a young heart hero means so much to our family. It has been an incredibly traumatic year for our family, and for Sienna to be recognised in a way to inspire others and to raise awareness means so much to us. Um, it really is like a small silver lining in what has been a very dark cloud for our family over the last year. I'll forever be grateful for Kaylee that day. She was truly heroic, brave, courageous. Um, and I look back on that day and I think, it's one thing performing CPR, but to perform it on somebody that you love with your best friend begging you to save their life is truly remarkable. To be Sienna's godmother, obviously, is an incredible honour. She's a massive part of my life. Um, I love her like she's my own daughter, really. My sister nominated me for the CPR Hero Award. Um, and if I'm honest, it feels really surreal. Um, but it's obviously incredible. Um, and it's an amazing um, recognition. Um, but I feel like what I did that day anyone would have done. For me, Sienna's the real hero. So I was playing a legendary game of golf with one of my best mates. On this spot, we were here. On the ninth tee, I hit my shot and I collapsed. Found myself in hospital two days later, having been told that I'd had a cardiac arrest. Uh, so I was obviously in shock, but uh, you know, my mate told me what had happened. I was unconscious while I was here, so I didn't know the events. He told me that there was a fellow golfer on, on the whole, parallel to us on the sixth, who uh, was a physio, trained physio, Aaron, who knew exactly what he was doing. He came over, did CPR, helped save my life, and you know, without him, probably wouldn't be here. Throughout my checks, quickly realised that the guy wasn't breathing, and then it dawns on you very quickly that he's, he's probably had some sort of cardiac arrest or something similar. So from then, um, again, still in autopilot, just go straight into CPR, try and direct people around us to, to ring the relevant emergency services to fetch a defibrillator, um, and then, yeah, just started working on guys as quick as I could with the CPR stuff, and just, just doing, doing as best I could until emergency services got there. I think six months or so after my cardiac arrest, I was diagnosed with long QT syndrome. Um, it's, it's a rare, rare heart disease. Uh, it doesn't affect me too much. It just means that I've got to take beta blockers on a, on a daily basis. Um, but, but apart from that, you know, it's, it's something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. But, but that's fine. I'm here today, and, that, and that's the crucial thing for me. Knowing that my actions helped to save someone's life is really humbling, and, and it, it's obviously something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. In many ways, I owe Aaron my life, definitely, um, and that's why, you know, I've nominated him for the Heart Hero Award.
Wow. I think mean, that, uh, that, that really brings home just how important learning CPR is. And I was privileged to, uh, to be invited to the Heart Hero Awards this year. The CPR programme sits under my, my team dream at, amongst others. And, um, and just meeting some of these incredible people and just hearing their stories, seeing the outcomes, seeing the success of, of, of their attempts, um, it really, really brings home just how important it is to learn CPR. Um, if you know of any heart heroes, um, we're taking nominations for this year, and I would really, really encourage you to do to, to, to nominate them. Um, the, the psychological um, impact of, of actually helping in a, in a cardiac arrest can be quite difficult it can be quite quite um, challenging um and as as ruth mentioned earlier it's so important that people get the support that, that you need afterwards um but also the recognition having these these heart hero awards give give you an opportunity to really recognize and 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 see the impact that they've they've had um uh, so so I, I i would really encourage you if you if you know of anyone who's who's intervened um, and who's, who's, who's helped in any way, then please do nominate them. Um, and I see that uh, the details have been put into the chat. So, so you should be able to get more information. And as, as, as you know, this session is being recorded so you can play that back and, and get further information if you need it. Um, okay, so thank you to everyone who's taken part so far. We're now going to move into the questions and answers session. Um, and I'm going to welcome back our speakers, Ruth and Barbara, um, to, to help answer some of those questions. And I think I'm going to hand over to Charlotte to, to field the, uh, the questions. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm happy, happy to do um, the questions and, and ask the, the panel. So I'm Charlotte from the research engagement team. Um, so I'm going to do the most photo questions first, and then I'm going to go down the list. Um, and um, hopefully um, uh, you all as panel can answer and let us know a bit more. So um, the first question we've got, which has got um, quite a lot of upvotes is, do we take the same approach for children? when we're performing CPR? I can kick this one off, if that's helpful. Um, so it is different if you are delivering CPR to a baby or a child. Um, you will be advised by ambulance control how, how to do that, where to position your hands, how many hands you use, if you're using finger like fingers on a baby or just one hand on, on, on a child, someone under the age of 18. Um, on our website, we have a really good page on um, how to deliver CPR to a baby or a child. So if you're wanting some more information, I would strongly sort of recommend you go and have a look at that. Um, and you may want to see if you've got any sort of local groups that, that provide sort of first aid or CPR training for, for, for babies and children, if it's something that you're, you're worried about. But there is, there is information there, there for you. Brilliant, thank you, Ruth. Is there anyone, anyone else wanna um, add anything else or um, anything you wanna add to that, what Ruth said? No, you guys are. Uh, so let's move on to the, the next question. So this is, I've always worried that I could make it worse by giving CPR. Could I kill someone if I did CPR wrong? Um, I, I'll answer that, shall I? No, there's nothing you could do that makes things worse. And um, if someone has collapsed, and their heart has stopped, they're not breathing, then if you do nothing, they will die. And anything that you do do, that's anything like CPR that we've just described could help. It won't always help, but it, it certainly can't make things any worse because things are as bad as they could possibly be. Thank you, Barbara. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to that or is that that kind of covers it, I guess? <laughs> I, I, I would just absolutely 100% endorse what Barbara's just said. And I can see Ruth nodding as well. Um, and you don't need to be a nurse to do this. The three of us are nurses, but um, but but you do not need to be a nurse to be able to intervene. That's that's the, the really strong message here. And even using the defibrillator, it talks to you. It will tell you what to do. You do not need to worry. I'll, it's easy for me to say you don't need to worry you're going to be worrying in in, in that context but but you, it is simple and it is easy to use I mean, could I yeah. just add could I just add that sometimes people are worried about giving CPR where it's not required yeah um, so if you start CPR and someone complains 
then you just stop. <laughs> um, it's highly unlikely that you'll do any harm just pressing once on their chest. So, you know, you can't get it wrong that way either. If in doubt, start and they'll soon let you know if you've got it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also just want to ask this question, and um, this is a great question of Ruth. Do you mind just demonstrating the hand movements? I know we were talking a little bit before the event as well yeah. about like which hand should go on top and which should go on bottom. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what hand. It doesn't matter what hand. Instinct will come in. You may find that actually your dominant hand ends up being the one on top, and you can swap hands over if you feel that one hand or one arm is getting more tired, then you can swap them over. So the first thing to do is get one hand like so. I'll do it both ways. Take your other hand and put it over the top. Curve your fingers over like so. So you can't really show you otherwise. And then you want to stretch your arms out. So you want to try and have your elbows locked as, as much as you can. And then this sort of wider part where your palms are and the heel of your hand, that's where you're going to sort of put in the center of their chest, sort of around this area. Um, sort of very much the center of their chest and that's where you're going to press down but you can do it equally you can do it with with the other hand it doesn't matter as long as you have that sort of strong arm positioning and and, and sort of some weight behind your hands then that's then that's all you need great thank you so much Ruth that's really <laughs> um I've got another question here can you do CPR on someone who has a CRTP and do you mind explaining what that is for people who might not be aware of what that is? I can take this one as well if you want. <laughs> um, so a CRTP um, is it's sort of like a pacing device. Um, it, it does sort of pacing and in some cases you can have you can have some which which have the defibrillator like an ICD sort of mechanism in them as well. The, the, the short answer to this is yes, you can. If someone has a device in, you can do CPR on them. You're not going to do any harm. You're not going to, you, you're not going to be interfering with the therapy. Because if they have that device in and they've gone into cardiac arrest, the device can't do anything to help at that point. If there's an electrical issue or there's not a shock, there's not a rhythm that a sort of an ICD can shock. So you you absolutely can do CPR on someone that has a CRTP or a CRTD or any sort of device in. Thank you, that's really, really useful. Um, this is quite a common question. I think you guys must have all heard this before, but um, if a stranger could, um, could they sue, sue me if something was to go wrong when I was performing CPR? Does maybe, Barbara, do you wanna jump in on that? Is that something you might um, be able to answer? Yeah, no, no one's ever been sued for doing CPR. Um, and as we saw in the video, usually people are very, very grateful. Um, so yeah, there's there's never been an example of anyone being sued. You're trying to help. Do you think um do you think this has come from America? Do you think this is like a myth that's maybe come from um from somewhere like that that makes everyone nervous? Yeah, I think possibly, but I think even in America, I think um, there's a, I can't remember the name of the law, Samaritan's law or Good Samaritan law or something like that. So if someone is trying to help and doing CPR, then they, they would be very, very difficult to see them even there. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Um, the next question is, is it okay to give CPR to a person who has a CABG surgery? Um, and I guess, uh, Ruth, you might be the best person to ask this. Do you again mind explaining what that is for anyone who's not That's aware? okay. Yeah, so um, CBG surgery is also known as cabbage surgery or bypass graft surgery. So that's when they sort of um, help restore blood flow to the heart. If you've got a lot of buildup and your, the arteries around your heart aren't working as well or the flow isn't so good, then you may have bypass grafts done. Again, quick answer is yes. Um, you may be more worried because they may have had a sternotomy, they may have a scar, you may be worried as like, oh, they've had, they've had their ribs open and they've had this operation. That you can still do CPR. I had the same worries when I when I started in a cardiac surgical sense, like, can I just can I just get on and do it because they've had surgery recently? But everything is so tightly knit together with wires and stitches and everything you're not going to do any damage or cause any harm. You, you do just need to do, you can just get on and, and, and do your chest compressions and deliver CPR. Thank you. Um, Jenny or Barbara, is there anything else you want to add to that or just an agreement? <laughs> no, 100% agree. Very easy, very uh, unified panel. <laughs> <I like it. laughs> 
Um, and Barbara, this is a question specifically for you. So how long do you estimate that social change in performing CPR will become natural behaviour through your research? So when do you hope that this will become um, settled in? Um, well, I think it's a big challenge, um, but you know, my research is, is going to take another couple of years. Um, if, for the time when it becomes the norm that everyone would do CPR, I think across the world that's quite a challenge. Um, but people like um, the British Heart Foundation and others are doing lots to try and make that the case. And so, for example, in Scotland, where I am, every school child is going to be taught CPR at school. Um, so, you know, we'll get to a point where almost everyone knows how to do it and hopefully doing the sorts of things we're doing where we're trying to um, create that confidence and um, and that idea that it is the norm to do it, more and more people will do it and more and more people will survive from out of hospital cardiac arrest. Brilliant, thank you, Barbara. Um, we're still getting lots of questions in, so I'll just keep going um, and, and asking these, these that are coming through. So um, someone asked as well, not sure when to stop CPR, first sign of movement, first sign of breath, first sign of pulse. Can anyone help with that? I would say don't stop until someone tells you to stop. Um, then either the patient, if they're telling you to stop, um, or when the ambulance arrives and they take over, or if someone more qualified or with more energy arrives, um, you know, you really need to keep going until help arrives. Um, and you know, usually that's very quickly. These calls are the ambulance services top priority. So help will be there fast although it might not feel like it in the moment. Um, but the most important thing is to dial 999 first so that that help is on its way. And you'll know that as you're doing the CPR and the call handlers stay on the line and will keep encouraging you and, to, and reassuring you that what you're doing is helping. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, we have another question for you again, uh, Barbara. And um, what will the next steps of your research be? And um, well, our next, we're looking at testing these things in simulations. So if that goes well, the next step would be to test it for real. So can we train call handlers to do this? Um, can they do it effectively and does it make a difference? Um, but also we're looking at other ideas around um, using behavior change techniques to send to people after they've done CPR training so that they get messages, you know, just dripping into their phone over months that remind them of the main messages and help them to stay confident. Um, and I'm also thinking that there might be a role for these call recordings that we've transcribed but to be able to use them to give realistic um, scenarios to people being trained as call handlers, who, you know, are pretty much thrown in at the deep end and are just hit with all this stuff. Um, it might help them, you know, to be able to encounter different barriers and, and think about things that they might say in a sort of simulated scenario before um, it happens for real life. So. I'm brimming with ideas. There's three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good to hear. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question here. Um, if you haven't the stamina, stamina to go full pace um, and to really give it your all when you're giving CPR, um, does a lower pace still help? Yeah, sorry, I'll jump in on this one. I'm sure Barbara will probably, probably want to say similar. <laughs> Yes, you you are. If you are one person and you are the one person who's delivering CPR and you haven't got any help, keep going as long as you can, as hard as you can. Your stamina may tail off; it happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. But any CPR is better than no CPR. That's that's sort of the the key the key message there. So, like I said, don't get hung up on on numbers or paces. The ambulance control will be sort of coaching you through this, telling you what pace to go at. But you will tire nobody is going to be able to just keep going and going and going but that's why we say call 999 because then we know that there's an ambulance coming to you and somebody is coming to take over and 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 relieve you yeah yeah and I think yeah. just to add to that it, it, it can be incredibly reassuring knowing that no, having that voice at the end of the phone um but also just having um when you are tiring having that that tune in the in your head that you can kind of do the pacing too um you may have seen on Spotify we, we did a campaign with Spotify over the last couple of months um where you can actually find your favorite tune to, to that, that, that goes at the right pace and just having that tune in your head rather than as Ruth said trying to remember numbers is incredibly helpful because it, you just get into the rhythm um but you will get tired and it's it's 
something is better than nothing and it, as long as you can keep going as long as you can until until um, help arrives yeah and I was just going to add that you don't know what help might arrive so you know someone else might stumble on the scene and be able to take over um, but also I've sat and listened to over 200 of these calls over the last year or so and it's absolutely astonishing what people can do in the moment um, I've heard very elderly people do CPR in remote areas for more than 20 minutes. They were amazing. And so, you know, adrenaline kicks in and also there, there's not much other option. You know, you just get on with it. Um, so I think people are capable of much more than they would ever have believed. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks all for, for answering that. And um, how can I tell if someone is having a cardiac arrest or just a heart attack? Um, is there any signs that people can use? So just to kind of go back to one of my slides, um, if someone is in cardiac arrest, it's like they'll be, they, they will be unconscious. Their heart is not pumping effectively, it's not pumping blood around the body. So they're, they're, they're not going to be getting blood to their brain. They're not going to be breathing properly. So that that's one of the big indicators. They'll be unconscious. And when you shake and shout and try to be them up, they won't wake up. Um, if it's a heart attack, most people are awake they are conscious they may be complaining of chest pain they may be clutching their chest having the pain which radiates down your arms around your back but it's more likely that they are conscious and can talk to you it's still a med medical emergency you're still going to be calling 999 it's the, the difference is they will be conscious in some cases like I said in my presentation some heart attacks can lead to a cardiac arrest. And you're not going to be able to distinguish that at that point. You're not going to say, oh, they're having a heart attack or someone who is having a heart attack may go into cardiac arrest before help gets there. But it's just recognizing when CPR needs to be started that's so important. Everything else will get dealt with once the paramedics arrive and they can give them the help that they need. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and this question, I think, is a really great question. Um, can you perform effective CPR if you just, you know, if you have one hand, if maybe one hand is injured? Is there any way that you can still do that? I don't know if you want to answer, Jenny. You look like you have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the answer is if, if you're the only person on the scene, anything you do is better than doing nothing so yes um i mean it, it's it, the optimum is is the two as, as ruth just demonstrated but but if you if you are, are unable to do that then then yeah one is one is okay thank you um we have um another question here um and this is on uh, what support is there for people for um that might have ptsd following performing cpr that might need support after they've done this i'm happy to start with this one so there is support there if if you if you do have ptsd or you're really struggling with sort of the aftermath then one of the best things you can do is go to your GP and, and they can put you in touch with specialist support, whether that's counselling or talking therapy or just letting you have that specialist sort of emotional and, and, and sort of that, that, that trauma sort of counselling, because it is it's, it's, it's a really big deal to do you're going to have mixed emotions It's a really great and brilliant thing to do, but it also comes with a lot of questions and a lot of worries particularly if it's not someone that you know but I would say the first thing to do if you, if, if you are being really bothered by it contact um, your GP or you can contact us on on the heart helpline and we can we can talk to you about some some other places that you can go other places you can go and ask there is help out there um, so so don't feel that you have to sort of sit with it on your own um, that there are places to go and, and people will be very understanding if, if you have had to deliver CPR, they, they, they will give you the support that you need. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and then, Barbara, we've got a, a specific question for you about your work again. And um, where could we find out more about your research or how could people get involved if they want to? Um. Well, when we're ready to share results, we'll share those with the British Heart Foundation. And um, so those will be available. Um, we can put links and things on the website and they'll be in scientific publications. And we'll do presentations like this to talk about them. 
Um, in terms of getting involved um, with this project specifically, um, it would only be people who are sort of in the area where we're recruiting for simulation and things that would be able to, to get involved. Um, but I do have other projects um, on the go. So if people are interested, they could just drop me an email or um, and I can see what I can do and um, put them in touch with you know, other studies that are going on if, um, if that's what people are interested in. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Barbara. And um, maybe we can put a little um, a link into to um, your biography so people can know a bit, a bit about you as well and reach out if they want to. Um, so we've got this next question that's come in and um, I'm a professional first aid trainer. Is there any specific BHF courses I can deliver and how do I go about doing them? Maybe Jenny, this might be one for you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So, so we we actually have um, the, the the purpose of Reviver is to make it as as easy as possible to to um, to, to to cascade it out into into the community. So it is a digital tool, um, and therefore it is designed to to not need a professional trainer to 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 deliver that training. Um, we um, we we equally have a, a, a solution for schools, which is which is framed around self service. Um, we we used to have face to face training. The challenge with face to face training, and look, there are some amazing face to face training services that are already offered out in the wider um, community through other charities as well, um, and and through. Um, through different schemes, um, so so the reason so the reason we don't do that is because that that space is already um, well serviced by others, um, and we want to ensure that we can enhance that by providing the digital solutions and the solutions that enable us to reach more people and 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 give people more confidence to to learn CPR um, in in a in in the way that we've just described. So Reviver is is our our sort of um, hero model at the moment, and we're we're looking to build and expand on that. So um, so so in in answer to the question, if you wanted to get involved and 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 pull together groups to deliver group reviver training it's you wouldn't be doing that training anyone can do it but by convening people in 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 that session together um and and taking them through the steps of 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 that and encouraging people to do it themselves um then you know we would definitely encourage you to get involved if, if you're able to yeah, great thank you so much jenny um, we've got a few more questions just in the last few minutes before we wrap up the event. Um, but are there any common warning signs of impending cardiac arrest? Maybe Ruth, is that one for you? Is that a good one? Yeah, that's one for me. Um, no, uh, there, there aren't. If someone goes into cardiac arrest, it tends to be very sudden. Mm. Um, we've, like I said, of a heart attack, heart attack can lead to a cardiac arrest, but you have that preceding sort of heart attack type symptoms but if someone has a cardiac arrest it can be very sudden they can just collapse it is tends to be a very sudden thing so there's nothing to say that it's that it's that there's a warning sign or anything to look out for unfortunately but yeah it is it tends to be very sudden okay thanks Ruth um just as we've got two more minutes I think we'll have to wrap it up there and I'll just let Lenny I'll uh, just let Jenny uh, wrap up the event for us um so thank you all so much. And uh, we really appreciate you answering these questions and, and, um, and talking to us today as well. So thank you again, all our panellists. Great. And, and thank you from me as well. And particular thank you to Charlotte for fielding those, those um, really rich questions. And thank you to the audience for, 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 for asking them in the first place. There's some, some really broad and interesting questions raised. So uh, much appreciated. So um, before we wrap up, um, I'd just like to thank you for, for watching this edition of Live and Ticking. Um, we hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our brilliant speakers. Um, and we do have one final poll question before we wrap up. As I mentioned at the beginning, I would like you to ask to, to ask you another poll, poll, poll oh, start again, poll question, um, which is how you would rate your understanding of CPR and cardiac arrest now compared to earlier. Um, so same as before, one is very low, five is very high. Wow, what a difference. Gosh, well, I really hope today has been useful. It looks from the poll that it has. Um, 
And uh, if we haven't managed to answer your questions today, then we do encourage you to visit our Heart Helpline um, or our information and support pages. Um, all of those links have been put in the in the um, in the chat. Um, and which which will be available after after the sessions closed um and uh, you know if you have any feedback um our live and ticking series is our series is monthly and we do strive to produce the best events possible so your feedback and comments are really valued and they're crucial to helping us plan and develop future events so um if we can ask you to complete the survey at the end of this event through or through an email um you'll be receiving in the couple of in the coming days we'd really appreciate it thank you again for joining us and goodbye everybody